Hi Tom. I just received this troubling email and would be grateful for your comments. I presume Tim was treating physician. That was David Ellison. He's a pathologist at St. Jude's Hospital in the U.S. He provided a second opinion regarding my daughter's brain tumor. The email that Ellison referred to was sent by me. Ellison was correct. It was a troubling communication. I'll read it to you. Dated March 27, 2015. Hello Dr. Ellison. This will sound harsh, but my daughter is dead as a result of your opinion. However, I am not placing any blame on you. You merely provided an opinion, though I am unclear exactly what was being asked of you. What concern was held by Royal Children's Hospital in Brisbane? Something seemingly inexplicable happened once your report was received by RCH. All local findings were disregarded. Your report supplanted everything, and Claire's diagnosis was changed from curable medulloblastoma to universally fatal glioblastoma. What was in your report that would have justified such an extraordinary leap from one diagnosis to another? I can see nothing that might warrant such behavior. Would I be correct in my belief that some diagnostic calls come down to probability? As you said in your report on a number of occasions, X is more likely and X is suggestive of, which tells me that nothing is ruled out. It just has a lower probability of being so in regard to the particular observation being made. One striking difference between your assessment and the local pathology findings was with regard to the presence of synaptophysin. You found the tumor cells to be negative. RCH found them to be positive. Twice. How significant would a finding of synaptophysin positivity by you have been on your assessment of the tumor? Did Dr. Robertson raise this matter with you? On balance, was there anything terribly wrong with the local diagnosis, which was medulloblastoma with prominent glial cell differentiation, which I have seen on numerous occasions in the literature of 2011 to 2015? Were you told that the tumor was in the cerebellar hemisphere and not in the brain stem? Pediatric cerebellar GBMs are amongst the most rare tumors to be found in a child. If your diagnosis was correct, Claire would have been the 26th child in the worldwide literature to be so diagnosed. It is interesting to note that despite your diagnosis, Claire was not treated as someone with such a rare tumor. In fact, we were told that RCH treats 10 to 12 tumors just like hers every year, very odd, very troubling. Finally, the tumor responded exquisitely to radiation. Unfortunately, owing to the change in diagnosis, Claire only received local radiation and died four months later of complications related to supertentorial metastases. I realize that hindsight is a wonderful thing, but assume for a moment that what I am telling you is so. Would you be tempted to select a different diagnosis if you could turn back time? Of course. Ellison never responded. Let's consider that email. There's a few issues to be teased out, I agree. First, let's consider what Ellison wrote to Tom Robertson, the local pathologist. He was clearly troubled by Mr. O'Leary's words. Understandably so. Did you note that Ellison knew who the oncologist was, just on the basis of the story that the email told him? Yeah. I hadn't missed that. It suggests that Tim Hassel might have fucked up big time before. I wonder what Tom Robertson's response was? Unless someone asks him, we'll never know. I guess not. And what about the location of the tumor? I've done some background on this. Strap in, it gets technical. Okay. Metalloblastoma, MB from now on. It's the most common high-grade pediatric tumor found in the cerebellum. It's the first choice of diagnosis based on location, with you so far, and glioblastoma. GBM from now on, is pretty rare in the lower part of the brain, unless it's in the brain stem, okay. Claire's tumor was located in the right cerebellar hemisphere, but originated from a place called the cerebellopontine angle. 
This is a common location for MB to develop. It is close to the brain stem, but not in it. Got you. That's why the brain stem location is important. If the tumor was in the brain stem, it was most likely a GBM. But if it was outside the brain stem, then it was much more likely a MB. Damn. You are quick, girl, but there's a wrinkle. There is an uncommon form of GBM called a cerebular GBM. This should tell you that it accounts for pretty much all GBMs found in the cerebellum. It's different to a normal GBM, with regard to treatment, yes. And this is the crux of the matter. This is why Robert believes that his daughter's life was deliberately cut short by hassle. Let's grab a drink and settle in for some brainstorming. Great idea, Lizzie. Tell me about the treatments of MB, GBM and the cerebular GBM. Robertson had diagnosed MB, and it seems that the pathological diagnosis never changed, because only a pathologist can change it, and Tom Robertson simply didn't. Really? Yes, but that's another story. The thing is that if the pathological diagnosis was MB, then the treatment would be maximal debulking surgery, followed by whole brain and spine radiation. Chemo would involve platinum infusions like carboplatin. Oh? You have done your research, Jeff. But Claire didn't get this treatment. Because someone changed the diagnosis to GBM. What do you mean, someone? Exactly that. Someone. We don't know who, and we don't know when. But the only person to document anything about the change in diagnosis was Tim Hassel. And he didn't document it as a change. He just said that the tumor should be considered a GBM. Well? It sounds to me like Hassel slipped a change of diagnosis into the notes while no one was looking. That's what Robert thinks, and it makes sense. But no one is talking. Which is the very definition of a cover-up. Anywho, back to the treatment issues. The MB treatment strategy is important because it addresses the possibility of the tumor metastasizing. If it isn't done, the child is as good as dead. Because the tumor was suddenly being treated as a GBM, several treatment issues arose. First, Claire had already had surgery for MB. Now she apparently needed surgery for GBM. This surgery needs to be much more aggressive. But the poor little possum didn't get that surgery. Right. GBM is highly lethal. It all needs to be removed surgically to have a chance at beating it? That's right. So not only did Claire not get the surgery that she supposedly needed, she also didn't get the aggressive radiation and chemo that is needed to beat MB. Instead, she got local radiation to the tumor bed, on the basis that GBM recurrence is generally within 2 centimeters of the original site and a normal chemo for GBM. So Claire's treatment had already gone to shit? It would certainly seem so. Now here is the wrinkle. That cerebular GBM. Claire was getting treatment for stock standard GBM, which is really uncommon in the lower part of the brain. And the tumor did not originate from the brain stem, so even if it was a GBM, it wasn't a brain stem GBM, um. What it means Lizzie, dear, is that if the tumor was a GBM, it was a cerebular GBM, and that's significant because, because it isn't treated like regular GBMs. It gets the same treatment as MBs because it's the only GBM that metastasizes. Oh crap. Nothing was done right, was it? So what you are saying is that it didn't really matter what the diagnosis was, because just on the basis of location, whether it was MB or GBM, the tumor needed to be treated with whole brain and spine radiation, plus platinum-based chemo, yep. And that's why there was the question about tumor location. Hassel knew that he'd got it wrong. The only out was to place the tumor in the brain stem. He tried hard to do that, even getting the radiologist to refer to brain stem infiltration in his report. But it was never a brain stem GBM. Hassel's treatment was wrong. Now reasonable minds might disagree, but this is Robert's conclusion, and the literature supports him. And without protection from METs, METs are going to occur. Which they did. And this was missed by the radiologist, leaving the Mets to develop for four months, while Claire received an almost no chemo. And the chemo she was getting was never going to act on MB, which was the official diagnosis, so why isn't this being looked at more closely? 
I mean, just the dodgy change of diagnosis is reason enough to investigate. Hell, if no one is talking, then there is something that needs to be talked about, don't you think? Yeah, I think. The question is, who has the will to take it on? If Oho won't, then there is really nowhere else to go, especially when the issue has already been stitched up and the complainant has been character assassinated. The ladies have summed things up quite well. But there is more to this matter, and I won't try to deal with it now. The thing is that whilst Claire may not have survived her brain tumor despite the very best attempts to save her life, the treatment that she got from Hassel absolutely assured her death. Hassel knew this to be so. He even told us that this was the case, and he absolutely refused to offer Claire treatment that would give her a chance at life. Like Lizzie and Jesse said, given the realistic differential diagnoses, the required treatment was the same. That's what we asked for. It made sense. It was supported by the literature, but instead of offering Claire the right treatment, Hassel persisted with treatment that had no hope of working. And he spent his time trying to shape the documentation to show that the tumor was a brain stem tumor that required the treatment that he was offering. Claire's life was ended because Hassel had more interest in tending his professional ego than he had in trying to save her. If he hadn't unlawfully inserted a new diagnosis into the file, Claire would have got the treatment that she needed, even if she actually had a cerebellar GBM at Pinks and McHugh and ensure that none of this really basic stuff was properly examined. And he killed off the review to maintain the pretense that Hassel acted appropriately. At Pinks and McHugh and actions require review. Without a shadow of doubt, he acted corruptly and in abusive office to protect Hassel and the health service and with regard to the review, to ensure that his own complicity in the cover-up was not exposed.